get our minds and our hearts into the resurrection of Christ from not the Gospels. Uh, this time I want to look at a letter from the Apostle Paul. Uh, it's called the Letter to the Romans. It's chapter 6, and I want to read verses 1 through 14. It speaks of the resurrection and then hones in on the, what I want to look at today, which is what difference does it make that Jesus rose from the dead? So Romans 6, 1 through 14, I'm going to read it. You can follow in your Bible or on the screen here. Um, but just remember as you follow along, this is God's word. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Let's take a moment just to pray, ask for God's help. Thank you, Lord, that <clears throat> we don't just speak words into the air, but right now, in this very place, you are present. And because you're here, God, we can call on you to help. Um, we confess our need. Uh, we need you to speak in a way that we can hear in a way that we can understand, in a way that we know, God, without a doubt, it's you. And so would you do that for us? Uh, we long to hear from you so that we can be changed by you. And so we pray that you would do that for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I like to connect, you know, centuries of how Christians have celebrated um, Easter. It actually got me thinking, um, and I didn't realize it till just this past week, today, this Easter is my 40th Easter that I have celebrated. Now, I'm older than 40 years old because we didn't, we didn't start in a church. My family weren't Christians. We weren't in the church at all until later. I became a Christian. I was in high school. But from the time I became a believer and I understood that Jesus is raised from the dead and committed my life to him, it's, this is now, this, today is the 40th Easter that I have been worshiping God. And I thought, well, that's kind of a milestone. But then I asked this at the first service. I better ask you guys, too. Has anybody um, been to more than 40 Easter services in your lifetime? Just raise your hand if you, if you have. And leave them up if you can. Anybody more than 50 Easter services? Okay, they're still up. Anybody more than 60 Easter services? They're still up. Anybody more than 70 Easter services. We still have some hands here. Anybody more than 80 Easter services? Good heavens. And you're only 39 years old. I don't know how that works. So we've got, we've got several. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of ham hocks right there that you're eating. That's a lot of Easter dinners. And, 
You know, as you think about that, I'm thinking, that's a lot of times where we have gotten up together, we've sung these songs, and we have focused on this central fact. Jesus rose from the dead. But because we do it so often, it's only once a year, but it seems a lot when you add them together, it does raise this question, but so what? What difference does it make that Jesus rose from the dead? If it really doesn't make any real difference in our lives, then it sounds good on one level. In fact, it, it probably sounds to some, I, I think there are several reasons, first of all, why it might not make a difference for some. And one of them, we're not going to focus on this today, but I want to mention it. Because some of you, I'm sure, in a group this size, there are some here today who aren't quite sure that it happened. Like you, you wonder, Cliff, you're, you're asking me to, to believe something that's pretty incredible. Someone who's really, truly dead, physically dead, comes back from the dead. And part of you, some of you are here and you're like, I, I, maybe I even want to believe it, but I, I can't. I, I'm really wrestling with that. I'm struggling with that. Can I just tell you, we're not going to focus on this today, but I would just encourage you, don't be afraid of the questions that you have about the resurrection. Seek them out. We, we think there's actually really good, strong evidence for the historical resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and we would encourage you to seek that out. Jesus said, if you seek, you're going to find. We don't think questions are a bad thing, and I wouldn't say... God is not offended by your question of that. Just follow the questions, though. Don't be content with just having the questions, but seek them out. So for some people, you're at that stage, and we just want to encourage you. This is a safe place to do that. I'm glad we have our questions and conversation tomorrow night, the day after Easter. If that's a, an area where you wrestle with, come and just talk about it with us. We would encourage you to pursue that. But some people aren't wrestling, you know, hey, I'm not sure if he raised from the dead. Some people believe Jesus was risen from the dead, but they have a hard time connecting how that changes anything in their life. And so for some people, Easter is very much like another day that happens early in the year, and it's a holiday for some, um, Groundhog Day. You know Groundhog Day? Um, everybody has the, the idea. That Groundhog Day is that day, it's the beginning of February every year, where everybody gathers around a certain, you know, furry rodent, uh, a groundhog in Pennsylvania, and they wait for him to come out of his burrow, and you know how this works. He comes out of his burrow, and if the groundhog sees his shadow, that means that KU advances in the NCAA tournament. <laughs> if he doesn't see his shadow, then you know what happened last night. So uh, we understand that. No, they say, well, it's connected to weather. If he sees a shadow, it's going to be winter for a longer period of time. If he doesn't see a shadow, it's going to be spring sooner. And, and so some people are like, yeah, I know that that's kind of the deal, but is there really, any, does that really make any difference? Does it actually make any difference to know what that groundhog does? And I just would say that some of your actual hard-earned tax dollars have gone to studies that show there's no correlation between what happens with that groundhog and the actual weather. And for a lot of people, that's kind of the resurrection. It's, well, it's kind of fun to celebrate. It's kind of a, a neat little deal. But Cliff, I really don't see it has any relevance, connection to real life. This text that we read today actually addresses that. It actually helps us to see why there's a disconnect for some. And yet for others, it absolutely changes your life. What, why is that happening? And it's going to look at just a couple of reasons here real quick. But I would point first and foremost to the first people who experienced the first Easter, the first resurrection day, the day in which Jesus' disciples, who thought he, had, he was killed, he was dead, they saw it happen, thought he was never coming back, and suddenly, three days later, he rises from the dead, and that this absolutely fundamentally changes them and this is part of the evidence because it's really hard to explain how a, a very small, and you've got to understand, a very small group of disciples who believed in Jesus, who were there to see him die, how that small group of people who became known as Christians, and they saw the power of Caesar and the power of Rome kill their rabbi, their Messiah, how they could now, 2,000 years later, Christians, by the way, means little Christs, how 2,000 years later, the number of Christians in our world can number in the billions. 
and little Caesar is the name of a pizza. How, how can that happen over the course of time? How, how do you get from this small group to this worldwide influential thing that happens? <clears throat> we celebrate today. We're not the only believers. Right now, all over the world, Christians are celebrating. How do you account for that? Well, they were changed. And it happened for two reasons. One, on that day, they go to the tomb and they see that the tomb is empty. But then, the real clincher is they actually see Jesus risen from the dead. They see him. They touch him. They talk with him. They put their fingers where the, 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 the scars from the nails are. He eats with them. He teaches them. And over a period of about 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead, he continues to reveal himself at various times and in various places that it is really him. He's back from the dead. And the empty grave and the experience, the personal experience that I saw Jesus, he is alive, so changed them. But then more than that, that Jesus at the end of that 40-day period said to them, and I am here, but I'm now going to leave you. And I'm going to ascend to my Father in heaven, but don't worry, I'm still going to be with you. You will still experience my full presence with you. Because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to come and not just be around you, near you, but to dwell in you. And you will have the full presence of the risen Christ living in you. And then you see this small ragtag group of disciples who come to this point where Jesus is now raised from the dead, but now the Holy Spirit comes on that day of Pentecost. And the same ones who were so scared they ran away when Jesus was arrested now in boldness stand up. And they say, he is risen. He is the true Messiah. He is the Son of God. And they're not afraid to die for Christ if need be. How do you account for that kind of change except this experience of the risen Christ? But the question is, why, why doesn't everybody get that change? Why isn't everybody having that? Well, a couple of quick things from our text. One reason that you may, and this may be your 30, 40, 50, 60th Easter, but you may not have ever experienced the difference that the resurrection of the Christ makes because of this first most important reason. Paul says it a number of times in our text. He says it in verse 5 a couple of times where he says, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, this really speaks to relationship. The question is, you might not have experienced the change that comes from experience in the resurrection because you haven't been united with Christ. Have you been united with Jesus Christ is the most important question that we can ask. Because Paul says, if we've been united with him. It's a huge if. He's basically saying to be united is a relational term. It's a term that defines how deep a relationship is. Well, we have all kinds of ways that we define relationships, how deep they go. This is one of those terms. You can think about it like this. When, way back in the olden days, when I was in school, there was a girl in my class, and I kind of fancied her. I, I kind of liked her. It wasn't really for superficial reasons. Um, I, I liked her because the way her hair bounced when she kind of walked. Um, and I liked the way her nose crinkled up when she smiled, and she smelled good to me. And so I, I kind of kind of scurried up the courage one day to go over to her. And I walked over to her, and I said, Hi, my name is Cliff. I would like to marry you. <laughs> and she said, No, thank you. And I said, Why not? And she said, Well, we're only in first grade. She said, and I would like to keep my options open. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, can we be friends? And she said, she thought about it for a second. She said, sure, just don't talk to me. <laughs> and I, I was like, of course, to me, I'm like, score, you know, yes. You know, we're, I'm close. I've, I've notched this relationship up just a notch. So I tell my buddies, you know, oh, we're really friends. So there's these levels of relationships. The Bible says, what's the highest? Let's go on just a human level here. What's the highest level of human relationship? The Bible describes it as marriage. Because there you can actually take two, and God says, God says he will join them together as one. That's being united 
in a relationship. That's a, that's a very deep level of relationship. The deepest the Bible can use in terms of human relationships. In fact, it becomes the metaphor for relationship with Christ. That the church, his people are the body, uh, that the, they're the bride of Christ and he is the groom. That we have this union, this connection in relationship that's so close that you have to be described as being united with him. Think about it. When you get united in marriage, everything changes. Your status changes. You, you no longer do your taxes filing single. You, you do it what? Married, married filing jointly because now that changes your status. Everything changes. Your schedule changes when you are united with someone in that way. What you eat changes when you are united with someone that way. How you sleep changes. Everything in your life is affected because one relationship that you've entered into has gotten so close it can only be described as being united. And the ultimate question is to ask, if you've heard about the resurrection and you say, I, I like Jesus, I believe in Jesus, if Jesus had a Facebook page, I would certainly ask to be his friend. If he had a Twitter, I would certainly follow Jesus, all his tweets every day. I would do all of that stuff. I believe God exists. I believe all that stuff. He died for my sins. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. But you've never been united with Christ. That could be the reason why his resurrection has not changed you. You say, well, how do you, how do you get united with Jesus? I, I can... I can marry somebody, but how do I get married to Jesus? How do I make that union happen? Well, in one way, it's really simple. It's really the same way. It's a decision. It's a decision. Jesus, I want to be connected to you in a personal, profound way that changes my status, that changes everything about my life and my routine. I want to make that choice. And so I got to ask you on Easter Sunday, have you made that choice? It doesn't matter how often you've gone to church. Have you made the choice to say yes to Jesus? John Ortberg was talking about a woman in his church who made that choice, but it came over a long period of time because she wrestled with, is the resurrection true? Is God, does God exist? And all the basic questions. And so she committed herself for a whole year of studying and seeking after the questions. And a church that will help people to do that without judgment, without fear. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. They would helped her to do that. For a whole year, she studied. And after a year, she came to understand something. Her real problem was not information. She actually came to a point where she said, there's enough evidence. There's good evidence for this. I can believe that. But she realized her real problem was she had issues with commitment. She had commitment issues. And she finally reached a point where she realized if I'm ever going to move into a real union, united with Christ relationship, I'm just going to have to make a choice. I'm going to have to make that moment count. And so he said in her home, she wanted to make sure she could reference this. And she was standing in her home in her kitchen, and there was a kind of a threshold into her dining room. And she prayed this prayer. She said, God, I don't want to just play church. I don't want to just be religious. I want to, or spiritual, I just, I want to be in relationship with you. To do that, I want to give myself to you. And to do that, I want to take this step. God, when I cross the threshold from my kitchen into the dining room, that's the step. It's going to be the biggest step I've ever taken. But when I make that step, I'm not going to turn back. This is all for you. And she takes that step. She crosses the threshold. And now she looks back on that moment and she says, when I have doubts, when I wonder, and I, I say, no, I'm I'm in relationship. I've married. I've been joined together, united with Christ. I know because I made that choice. Now, that's, God does it in so many different ways, but I want to just encourage you. There's also a, another way that God gives us a sign, kind of a symbol that you've been joined to him. Our text talked about it. Baptism. Baptism itself doesn't change, make that relationship happen, but what it does is it signifies you've made the choice. And if you have accepted Christ, but you've never been baptized, I just want to encourage you, think about doing that. Talk with us. We'd be happy to baptize you because that becomes a great moment to say, I know I'm united with Christ. I had a sign done that just pointed to the fact I made that choice. Have you made that choice? If you haven't, I don't think the resurrection is going to be much more than Groundhog Day for you, but it can be way more than that. Make that choice. But then here's the second thing he says. Verse 11, 
In the same way, count, our, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. One of the reasons the resurrection may not change your life is if you have not counted yourself dead to sin. That you may have accepted Christ, but you're still living the same basic lifestyle because you have not done what Paul says here, which is, I want you to do the math. It's really an accounting term. He says, count yourselves dead to sin. He's saying, do the math on this. To really be changed by the resurrection, you have to look at your life as you've joined it with Christ, but look at your sin. As you do that, sometimes it's hard to believe what you've come up with. Now, this is back before computers did everything, and it, those of you, you, maybe you still do, keep your own checkbook, you know. Now, I don't mean on the computer. I mean writing it out, and you're, you're, you know, making all the... As you do that, sometimes you count it up. You make your additions, your subtractions, and all that stuff. And sometimes you do your calculations, and you come up with a number, and you're like, well, that can't be right. You know, you're, li you're like, what do you do? You go back, and you start counting again. You're like, well, I must have made a mistake somewhere. And if you do it again, you come up with the same number, you're like, well, that can't possibly be right. And you calculate again until finally, at some point in time, you realize something has to change. My thoughts of what I had are way different than the reality that I've just calculated. And I have to adjust what I was thinking or else I'm going to be living in denial, which means most of my checks are probably going to bounce if I don't somehow come into reality and say, this is what I've really accounted it to be. Let me just say, the counting up doesn't change the reality. It doesn't create the reality. It simply reveals it. That's all it's doing. So you counting your sin is not trying to make your sin worse than it really is. It's simply coming to grips with the reality of, so if his resurrection happens because he dies for my sin, maybe I haven't counted my sin to understand what his resurrection really does for me. How do you count your sin up? Well, when you really start to count it, it's, it's more than, than the first stuff. The first level of counting our sins is usually, well, have I done the bad stuff, you know, the really, really bad stuff? And so we start counting if I've, you know, if the old thing of, you know, you don't, you don't uh, dance or chew or go with girls who do that kind of thing. Uh, you know, I haven't done the really bad thing. I haven't lied. I haven't stolen. I haven't done all those things that I think are morally bad. Well, that's one way to count your sin. But then to really count yourself dead to sin, what the Bible says and what you find Jesus helping us to do is he says, don't just count the bad stuff. Count the good stuff that you do for the wrong reason. Because you can do any good thing and it becomes sin because you do it for the wrong reason. Jesus was just absolutely crystal clear about these things over and over in his teachings. You can come and worship God and it can be sinful. You're like, how is that possible if you're coming to worship God? Because if your worship is just a ritual... It simply becomes this empty ritual. God gets no glory of it. It's a sin. Sometimes Jesus says you'll do that because you want to be seen by other people. And it becomes sin because it's really about you, not about God. You can pray, Jesus says, and it becomes, you say, well, that's got to be good. That can't be a sin. Jesus says you can pray and it becomes sin. Why? Because if you pray to be seen by others, you're doing it that you get the glory, not dependence on God. You can serve how can serving the needs of others possibly be a sin as we count it up? Because Jesus says, because you can serve in such a way that it's really about you. I can serve you so that I get a reaction from you that I want. And so really what I'm doing is serving me. Oh, feed me, feed me, feed. I'll do this for you, but you have to give me a certain... Jesus says, you can even serve and it becomes a sin. Now, if we start doing that and counting that up in our sin, oh man, well, there's no end. You're like, well, that can't be right. That can't possibly be right. How, how can my sin be this deep, this bad? But you understand those who recognize how deep their sin goes, they realize more than they knew before how deep God's love goes. And the accounting of our sin is not meant to put you into some kind of morbid, guilt-ridden state. It's meant to say, do you realize how lost we are? without a Savior who would die and rise again for us. Paul says, count yourselves dead to sin. And also, not just because you count up the number, but the effect. 
sin grows at compound interest. Sin grows at compound interest. In other words, because I sin, it's not just that I've sinned in this way, but I don't stay the same. We say this a number of times here. Every action that we do, good or bad, changes us one way or another a little bit more, either more into righteousness or more into evil and wickedness. It, you're not the same person. Those of you who have been to wor Easter worship service, you're not the same person you were 30, 40 Easter's ago. Every act of sin compounds itself in its interest. It, it actually grows in a certain rate. Think about it this way. And this is, the older I get, the more I think of these things, I guess. But the older I get, I don't like it because you start to see physically, you start to th see things get worse and worse. They don't stay the same, right? So my eyesight is getting worse and worse the older I get. My, my hearing is getting worse and worse. I'm losing hair where I should have it, and I'm gaining hair where I shouldn't have it, and all that stuff happens, and, and getting old stinks. And that's probably me too, because my BO is getting worse the older I get all the way through. So as you look at there, like, well, this just gets worse. It doesn't stay the same. It gets worse and worse. And sin is just like this. If I am an angry person as maybe a toddler, and you hear people say this, wow, they've got a temper. If nothing is done to change or check that temper, does it get better, stay the same, or get worse? Well, it gets worse. It doesn't stay the same. It actually grows worse and worse. And then you see this, everybody sees this. Someone, if it's never checked their whole life, by the end of, say, a 60, 70, 80, or 90-year life, what started as one thing has blown up, and now an anger that was a problem early has grown by compound interest to become a rage and a fury. And we say, not just that they are a person who gets angry, we say, that's an angry person. And bitterness, same kind of thing. If you're bitter now and nothing is done, nothing happens to you to change that, that bitterness will not stay the same. And you and I have seen the tragic cases of someone who's grown old and has become the bitterest of people. Oh, it just eats them up from the inside out. Now that happens over the trajectory of a life that might be lived for 60, 70, 80, 90 years. You say, well, it can get pretty bad in 90 years' time. What if you took that trajectory not just over 90 years, but over eternity. What if my anger didn't get checked for all eternity? Wouldn't it be rightly described as a furious hell that in fact my anger grown to over eternity would be hellish in its aspects? What if my self-righteousness is never checked, it's never changed, over 90 years, that could get pretty bad, pretty smug, just kind of nasty. Nobody wants to be around a self-righteous person. What about spread out over eternity? What happens to self-righteousness? Doesn't it become a black hole where somebody just becomes so self-focused that they actually implode on themselves? It becomes this hellish hole of self-interest. Do you see what happens with sin when you really count it up? Lust over eternity becomes this nightmare of burning, unfulfilled desire. It might be a problem now, but stretched over eternity, it literally becomes hell. And this is where our God says, I love you too much to let you go on that trajectory without doing all that is necessary for you to understand and know how to be saved that I die on the cross, I rise from the dead, and my resurrection is enabling you now to be changed if you can count up your sin and die to it. When we accept this accounting of our sin, we find out this truth. Our sin is way worse than we thought. And then we find out this ultimate truth, and we are loved way more than I thought to. I, I'm way worse than I think. I'm loved way more than I ever knew. This is the gospel that we preach. Here's the other thing that happens then. This is where real change then. If, we, if you and I can count up our sin, if we can recognize we need to be in union with Christ to accept him and receive his life for ours, then, Paul says, then you start to see how people are changed. You see why disciples who are just don't have a clue can suddenly have such a change in their life that they stand strong for Christ. 
You can see people in our day and age who are going one direction, and in a moment, God begins to make a change that affects them for the rest of their life for good. How does that happen? Well, we've got to give ourselves daily in gratitude. He says, if you understand all of this, if you receive it, then suddenly you can respond with gratitude. Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. In other words, Paul said it before, we have to come alive to God. We have to come alive to God. How do you do that? You can't, you can't bring that up yourself. You can't just kind of work that up. To, i got to come alive to God. It, it happens when you know that you've been loved first. We love because we, he first loved us. It happens spontaneously. It's a gift that is given to you but you become open to receive it, and then you respond. Gratitude is proportionate, is proportionate to what you think is at stake. Some of you came in today, and someone held the door for you when you came in the door. You probably were prompted, I hope not out of guilt, but you're just like, hey, thank you. There was a response. Nobody told you you have to say thank you. Maybe your mom did as she's standing right behind you. You better tell them thank you. Open the door for you. But at some point, you feel like, hey, thank you for doing that for me. I mean, if this was Donut Sunday and you guys gave me your donut in addition to my own, I'd be really, really thankful. There'd be something rising within me to say, huh, I might send you a card. I mean, I might send you a note to say, hey, just thank you, man. This is awesome. You sent me your donut. As the level of gratitude rises, it comes proportionate to what you think matters most. So now you take this to on just a human level here. I asked this at the first service too, and it, we had several hands. You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want, but if, if you're okay with this, has any, anybody here actually been physically saved? You were drowning, and someone saved you. You, you were dying, maybe you had a heart attack, somebody gave you CPR. In some way or another, there's, there's a person that you could actually point to and say, you know, Cliff, I wouldn't be here for this Easter if it wasn't for this person who literally somehow saved my life. Anybody have an experience of that in your life? There's a few hands here. You know you can point to somebody and say, I would, I would not be here without them. Now, I'm not going to ask you to respond here, but what's your response to that person? Did you feel obligated? If that person was here today and they said to you, hey, could you do me a favor? Would you go, oh, gosh, here we go again. You know, every time he saved my life and now I've got to do anything he asks you. Or is it still fresh and new? Is there something, that, are you alive to them where they say to you, hey, could you do me a favor? And you say, of course. Are you kidding me? You saved my life. You want me to cut your grass? I'll cut your grass. I'll get whatever it is. I mean, there's, there's an aliveness to the person that you know. Huh. Well, my life to him. Now, stretch this a little bit further. There was, um, in 1986, uh, Laura and I were living in Chicago at the time, but I remember this crystal clear. In, at the end of the Vietnam War, of course, our nation did not do a good job in welcoming back our soldiers who served well. Our country did not do a good job with that. It took 11 years. The, the uh, Vietnam War ended in 1975. It wasn't until 1986 that in Chicago they held a parade for Vietnam veterans to honor them, 11 years after the fact. But it was a big deal. I remember this. It was on TV. And they had this, as part of this parade, they had kind of a portable version of the Vietnam Memorial, you know, where they have all of the names of over the 58,000 service people who died in Vietnam. All those names on that wall. And they had a portable version of that part of this parade. And they had the TV interviewer was, was on the street there and had found a veteran who was there who actually was not from Chicago, had actually traveled halfway across the country to come for this one-day event, just one parade. And the, the reporter had this, this person, this guy, and he's like, so can you tell us why you would come all this way to come to this parade? And I can remember because the guy, his tears are streaming down his face. And he took his finger and he pointed to the wall, one name. And he said, I'll tell you why I'm here. Because of this guy right here. And he began to trace 
the letters in the man's name. He said, this man right here saved my life. He said, it's not a problem for me to come all this way to be here because this man saved my life. Now you see a gratitude. Nobody has to tell him, hey, you should be grateful. It, it grows, it's spontaneous, it's a gift given to him that from his friend. Now I want you to imagine one thing with that scene. Can you imagine what would happen if from behind the wall stepped his friend? In that moment, can you picture what, what would happen in that moment between a man who recognizes I would not be here without my friend and suddenly the friend steps out from behind the wall. He's not dead. In that moment, the, the joy would be overwhelming. In that moment, the gratitude would bring him to his knees. In that moment, nobody has to tell him how to respond. Because when you know what was at risk and you know who saved you, you come alive to them. Do you understand why Easter is not just a holiday for some who have counted their sin, who've recognized if it weren't for him, but he walks out of the grave. So now it's not just a memory of him. It's not just a thought of trying to honor someone who's dead. It's not a memorial service, but instead it's the opportunity to say, he lives, and now I live for him. I live for him. There's nothing he could ask me to do that would be beyond what I would want to do because I'm so grateful for what he's done. And that's because you've stretched it out not only in this life, but also for all eternity. Jesus takes the hell of our sin. He takes it on himself. He says, it would destroy you. I love you so much. I die for you. It's personal. And when you get united with him, he helps you count it up, and he says, oh, that's more than I thought. That, that goes deeper than I thought. Your love is deeper than I thought. It's wider than I thought. It's higher than I thought in every possible way. I want to serve you in gratitude, not guilt, not pride. Oh, that's why we say, he's risen. There you go. I didn't give you the coup. He is risen. Yeah, that's why we say it. That's why we're here. And I pray, this is where I want to pray, if you have not been united to Christ, I guarantee you, this would only be Easter number one for you, but you will never forget this Easter. Let's pray.